Okay, the Torah portion today is what? Zav. Now, uh, what does it mean? Okay, does anyone know what a mitzvot is? Mitzvot are the commandments. So here we have the word command, that's Zav. What letter is this? Uh, over here, what is this? The, the sade, okay, which makes the T-S sound, and this is the V, so that's sav. Sav. Does everyone see that? Okay, now, when you put an M and a, or a mem and a tav, you get command months, plural. A mitzvah, Mitzvah is singular command. Mitzvot is plural command. All right? So this is the mem, which is the M, and this is the tav, which is the T. So here you have mitzvot, and that means command months. Now, the other thing is this. <clears throat> what does the vav mean as far as the, a word meaning. Every letter is also a word. Vav is a word. And what does Vav mean? Yeah. It's the word and. And so it's a conjunction and it means to connect. Are you following me? To connect. Now the Zade, do you remember what that is? What is a Azadic? Azadic? Uh, oh, yes, it means a, a fish hook. Okay, but it also means the righteous. A tzaddik is someone who is righteous. And so, the righteous connect to God through the commandments. That's how we connect. You see why the devil wants to do away with the commandments? He's doing away with how we connect to God. Now, Zav or zot, get rid of the mem for a minute and look at zot. <clears throat> Do you know what that means? Team, you're on God's team. It's like a, it's like a, a yoke, okay? You are now on God's team. Now here, this, those two letters means to attach. The righteous connect to God. We're a team when we are attached, like God says, take my yoke upon you. A yoke is for two, God and you. And so that's why he says, take my commandments because my commandments aren't grievous. Oh my goodness, I gotta love Jill and Joe. I mean, oh, that's really tough, that's hard. Uh, but here's the other thing. Think of it this way, as a three-legged race. The purpose of the commandments is us attaching ourselves to God as a team, and we're going to the goal. But guess what? Just like a bicycle built for two, the parent in front does all the pedaling. And that's how we have to understand the commandments. So do you want to be on Messiah's team? Yes, uh, if we want to be on Messiah's team, we need to connect to him. And how was that done? By being yoked together, being on the same team. Uh, let's start with Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. Yeshua says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you what? So the problem is we are laboring without being connected to him. And that's why it is so hard and we need rest. Just like in the uh, Exodus, the plagues, they had all this labor, but there wasn't any connection to God and God gave them rest. Look at this. He says, take my yoke upon you. I mean, how many of us want to put a yoke on? It's like, oh, that means work. But God says, look, put my yoke on you. And then he says, learn from me. I'm gentle. I am lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. 
See, we have the wrong concept of the yoke. How many of you know the Bible says we're not to be unequally yoked? Wow, okay. So God is not ever going to be unequally yoked with you. Now, look at this. Doing the commandments is what unites us to God and makes that connection come alive. The problem is sometimes it's, it's not alive. We're dead. We're in religion. We're just going through the motions, but it, we're not eager to do it. So um, we have, how many of you know, a body and a spirit? Okay. What happens if one of them disconnects? <laughs> You're dead. Okay. Uh, there is within the mitzvah itself or the commandments or commandment, what successfully connects the physical realm to the spiritual realm, okay? So like we have the physical realm, but we need to connect to the spiritual realm. That's what Yeshua is wanting us to do. Performing the mitzvah creates the connection between us and God, who is the commander. If he has commandments, or if there are commandments, there has to be a commander. If we say the law is done away with, we say there's no commander anymore. Now we do what's right in our own eyes. This is why we have to keep the commandments so we realize there's a commander. The other thing that's amazing to me is the word tzav is a military term. It's a military term. And we're not to drag our feet. We're not, I mean, uh, they say to do something, it's yes sir, and you go do it. Uh, how many of you remember Abraham ran? Whatever he did, he, he ran. It was something eagerly he wanted to do. And that's why the Bible says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. We're not supposed to be dragging our feet, moaning and groaning. No, oh, man, I got to go be nice to that person. Um, let's go to Leviticus. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. Look at chapter 22, verse 17 and 18. It says, the Lord spoke to Moses, and he said to do what? Speak. Speak to Aaron, to his sons, to all the children of Israel, and say to them, whatever, uh, soever he be of the house of Israel, or the strangers of Israel, that will offer his oblation for all of his vows and for all of his freedom offerings, which they will offer to the Lord for burnt offering, and it goes on. But this word speak has the idea also of a command. Like the word shema, what does that mean? Hear and obey, not just hear it, just like we tell our kids when you dump the trash and they never do it. Hey, and the kid goes, I hear you, I hear you. But you don't want them to hear you anymore. You want them to do it. Okay, well, going back to the Torah portion, Leviticus 6, 24 and 25, the Lord is telling Moses, say this to Aaron and his sons, this is the law. Okay, so this is, this is like the commander commanding the soldiers that uh, for the sin offering, the sin offering is to be put to death, where? Before the Lord in the same place as the burned offering, it is most holy. Just like when we are to appear before the judge, that means we appear before the judge. Well, God says the sin offering always has to be done before my face. And this is another reason why Yeshua died on the Mount of Olives before the face of the judge, not in the back 40 behind it like Christians think happened. Leviticus 6, 9. Here he says, command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, how long? All night long until the morning and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. Okay, so it lasts all night and you better not let the fire go out. Why? The fire on the altar was from the heavenly fire that fell. It's not a man-made fire. This is a heavenly fire that fell that was supposed to be kept burning all of the time. The word, this word where he says command... It implies that they are to be especially zealous in performing this service. It's not just do it. You have to do it zealously. You have to want to do it, run to do it. 
But oh my goodness, this is the night shift. How many of us like, how many of you guys work the night shift? How in the world are you here today? <laughs> uh, but the, the main thing is they have to put their whole heart into it. The fire's never to go out. Now, uh, when you look at Genesis chapter 46, verse 2, God said to Israel in a what? In a, it was in a night vision. And he says, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, what? Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Go down to Egypt without fear, for I will make a great nation of you there. Now, see, this was only mentioned to Jacob, but of course, he took his whole family <laughs> with them. But here's the other thing that just kind of popped in my mind. How many of you sometimes are fearful to go somewhere? And then if, if God says, okay, I want you to go there because it's going to end up great. Will that get rid of your fear or will you still go with great trepidation? <laughs> I mean, a lot of us, how many of you like to go into the fire? I don't think anybody likes to go into the fire. But I tell you what, if God says, well, I'll be with you. Ah, okay, I'll go. And that's like the children in the fiery furnace. And look at Genesis 19, 27. Abraham was told to sacrifice his son Isaac. How many of you would be in a hurry to do that? <laughs> did I really hear from God? Let me wait a couple more weeks and see. But it says Abraham got up early in the morning and went to the place we've been talking to the Lord, with the Lord. Uh, Genesis 25, 21, here Isaac makes a prayer to the Lord for his wife because he didn't have children. And the Lord gave ear to his prayer and Rebekah became with child. Um, again, we need to pray and then act on those things. Uh, in Leviticus 16 or 610, it says the priest has to put on his linen garment, linen breeches, ale to put on his flesh, and then he has to take up the ashes where the fire has consumed the burnt offering on the altar, and he will put them beside the altar. Can you imagine having a white linen garment completely, and you're taking up these dirty ashes? They're going to get all over your garment. They're going to get everywhere. And can you imagine the first job for the priest is dump the trash. <laughs> I mean, like, that's beneath me. I'm a priest. Why do I have to dump the trash? Let one of these civilians dump the trash. But no, it, his first job was to dump the trash. How many would volunteer? I want to dump the trash. But they had to be eager even in dumping the trash. And then when he put on his linen garments, I mean, again, there were tens of thousands of priests during Messiah's time, tens of thousands. And everyone's garment was a custom made garment. None, there weren't no one size fits all. They were all tailored and they didn't last that long because they'd get blood all over them and ashes all over them. And they'd have to get another fitted garment. A lot of people were involved in helping the priesthood. <clears throat> and if you look at Leviticus 6.12, it says, And the fire upon the altar has to be kept burning. It's never to go out. And there had to be another priest who would kindle the wood every morning. And then he has to lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he uh, shall make smoke thereon the fat of the priest, priest offerings. But all these, there were thousands of priests that would do er little steps of everything. <clears throat> look at Leviticus 6.13. Again, it says... <clears throat> the fire will be kept burning upon the altar continually. It is not to go out. And look at verse 6, 25, 26. Speak unto Aaron and <clears throat> say to his sons, this is the law of the said offering. Can you imagine? It's always the law. This is, I'm, you're commanded to do it this particular way. <clears throat> In the place <clears throat> where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. And it is what? Most holy. Wow, there's holy, holy, and most holy. And then look at this. <clears throat> the sin offering, the priest who offers it has to eat it. In the holy place, it's to be eaten <clears throat> in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, how many of you like to barbecue? steak, hamburgers, chicken, whatever. How many have ever had it get burnt? 
But guess what? This would make the priest barbecuer make sure it didn't get burnt because they had to eat it. So here they're doing the cooking and watching the fire and the steak or hamburger because it's a cow that's sitting there, you know, for a burnt offering. I would sure want to make sure, you know, I, you know, spiced it up a little bit, make sure I wash it, make sure it was good. I mean, how would you like to be, man, this is so hard work. I've got to eat a T-bone every morning. I mean, I'd be running to do this too. Okay. <clears throat> the sanctity of the sin offering, how it is most holy, teaches us about the precious and priceless nature of Messiah's sacrifice. All of this represented him. And this is why God said, I, I want to see this. I want to face to face because this is going to be representative of my son coming another 1,500 years later. But that shows you why it was most holy. In Leviticus 7, 1 and 2, this is the law of the trespass offering. It also is most holy. And in the place where they kill the burnt offering, he'll kill the trespass offering, and his blood he will sprinkle around the altar, just like Messiah's blood was sprinkled. And if you remember in the original Exodus at the covenant, that Moses took the blood of the covenant and he took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people. Leviticus 7, 6, and 7. <clears throat> Every male among the priests can eat of it and it has to be eaten in a holy place. It is what? Most holy, just as the sin offering, just as the trespass offering. Uh, there's one law and the priest who makes atonement with them shall also have it. So the sin offering, the burn offering, the trespass offering, all has to be done in the very same place. And it is very important that they eat that. And how many of you remember, what did Messiah say? My body that is given for you, eat of it, okay? So he wasn't talking about Holy Communion, okay? Uh, and he wasn't talking about us being a cannibal, he was taught, the whole concept came from all through the sacrifices, the priests would eat of it, of the sacrifice, and it just meant we wanted it to become a part of us. When we eat, it becomes a part of us. Messiah wants to literally become a part of us. And then we see, <clears throat> here is the law of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, which one shall offer to the Lord and then look at this. There's different kinds of peace offering. Passover was a peace offering. It wasn't a sin offering. Passover was a peace offering. And it says here, <clears throat> if, he, <clears throat> sorry, if he offers it for a thanksgiving offering, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened uh, cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mixed with oil. That's referring to the anointing, the Holy Spirit, okay? That's what this is referring to. <clears throat> I mentioned this a little bit last week. I'll go into it just a little bit more. But from Psalms 107, that's the key psalm. We'll look at that here. It was derived, there were four categories of people who were required to bring the thanksgiving offering to express thanks and gratitude to God. First, here's one of them. If they went on a desert journey, okay, how many of you know out in the desert there's all kinds of critters, evil beasts that just might get us, okay? Also, if you survived this de desert journey, you had to give a thanksgiving offering. And then another one was <clears throat> if someone got out of prison, they had to bring a Thanksgiving offering. If someone survived a major injury you, and had to go to the hospital, then you were required to bring a Thanksgiving offering. If you survived a sea voyage, okay, you also had to bring an offering because they thought it was so dangerous always being at sea. And they had to recognize that it was God who saved them. 
So Psalm 107 is all about the offerings. And I want you to look at verse one. How does it begin? Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. So uh, it's just like when, how often when we pray, do we come to the Lord and start with, oh, give me, give me, give me, help me, help me, oh, help me. No, the way we come to the Lord is with thanksgiving. We begin there giving thanks to him. We have to recognize he is good. We have to recognize his mercy endures forever. And then look at verse two through six. It says, so let the redeemed of the Lord say whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. He gathered them out of the lands from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the sea. The sea was in the west, the Mediterranean Sea. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert way. They found no city of habitation. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. So here's the one that's just wandering in the wilderness. We'll look at verse 8 through 16. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy, for his wonderful works to the children of men. He satisfied the longing soul and the hungry soul he's filled with good. And then it says, such as those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death being bound in affliction and iron because they rebelled against the word of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. He says, therefore, he humbled their heart with travail. They stumbled and there was no one to help. So that's when they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saves them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness, the shadow of death. He broke their bands in sunder. Then it says, let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron and sunder. That's freeing the prisoners. Okay, look at verse 17 through 22. Crazed because of the way of their transgression and afflicted because of their iniquities, their soul abhorred all manner of food and they drew near to the gates of death. And they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them out of their distress. And how did he do it? What did he send? His word. It's the word that saves us. And we know Messiah is the word. But he sent his word and he healed them. He delivered them from their graves. Wow, there's a promise of the resurrection. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy, his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them offer the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with singing. So this verse that they derived these particular four things to be thankful for, that you have to bring thanksgiving offerings. But now, look at this one, verse 23 through 32. Those who go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, okay, this is talking about those going out on the Mediterranean Sea, they see the works of the Lord, his wonders in the deep, There it is. He commanded and he raised the stormy wind. So look at that. God commanded and he raised the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves. How many of you ever been out in the ocean when that happened? (laughs) He lifts up the waves to heaven and they went down to the deeps. Can you imagine being in a boat and the wave is real high going up toward the heaven and then it crashes and you're going back down? It says their soul melted away because of trouble. They reeled to and fro. They're staggering like a drunken man and all their wisdom is swallowed up. This is those who are out on the big ocean. They realize how little their big boat is. And then it says they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He brought them out of their distresses. He made the storm a calm. So the waves thereof were still. Then were they glad because they were quiet and he led them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the seat of the elders. Now, here's the thing. How many of you know the Psalms were songs? And that's an easy way to memorize words is to put it to music. The Psalms is what all the disciples knew. The disciples would sing this song. And of course they knew the words. 
They knew the words. Let me see something. <laughs> uh, okay, I may go ahead and do this anyway. Um, let's, it, it says they went quiet and they, he led them to the desired haven. So the, all the disciples knew this verse. Now look at Mark 4, 35 through 41. The same day when the even was come, he said to them, let's pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other what? Okay, there's little ships, a whole bunch of little ships, and he's in the big ship, right? Now, watch what happens. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves were beating into the big ship so that it was now full. Where do you think the little ships are now? If the waves are crashing into the big ship, all the little ships, the disciples can't see the little ships. They've all flipped. You following me? And then look what happens. He was in the hinder part of the big ship and they sleep on a pillow and they woke him up and said to him, Master, don't you care that we perish? We can understand why they perish. They're in the little ships and you don't care for them, but you care for us. Why don't you, you want us to perish as well? And <clears throat> he arose and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. This is Psalm 107. They know this song and it is God who commands the storm to come. It is God who commands the storm to cease. And they're seeing this happen right in front of them. And he says, why are you so afraid? How is it you have no faith? And then they feared exceedingly and they said one to another, what kind of a human is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Wow, that's the kind of human he is, he's God. Well, look at Psalm 50, 23. Whoever offers the sacrifice of thanksgiving, what are they doing? God says, they're glorifying me and prepares his way so I will show God's salvation to him. Do you know what was required for a thanksgiving offering? They had to bring 40 loaves of bread. They had to bring 40 loaves of bread. They had to have a minimum of 10 people who would witness their giving thanks that you made it safely back home. 30 of those 40 loaves were unleavened. They included oil. 10 loaves were leavened without oil. Four loaves were sent to the priest. The other 36 were shared with their friends. I mean, this was the, the law of the Thanksgiving offering. They were voluntarily done. They weren't required but they were to be thought of as a moral requirement rather than a legal requirement. We owe so much to God, we should be ever thankful. And every day brings new opportunities to appreciate God's goodness to us. And we must express our thanks in a timely manner. It's one thing to give thanks after it happens. Maybe two years later, you finally give thanks. It kind of loses the meaning, okay? So we also have to be telling God, thank you. Now, Look at Leviticus 8, 3 through 7. Let me see what time it is. Okay. It says, And let all the people come together at the door of the tent of the meeting. And so Moses did as the Lord said, and all the people came together at the door of the tent of the meeting. And Moses says to the people, This is what the Lord has given orders to be done. And then Moses took Aaron and his sons, and after washing them with water, he put the coat on him, making it tight with his band, and then the robe, and over it the ephod, and with his band of needlework to keep it in place. So what is going on? This is the inauguration ceremony. This is Nisan 1. This is this coming April 8th when the solar eclipse. This is happening on that day. This is a reminder of this event, okay? Now, typically they would go to the laver and wash their hands and feet, but in this case, it was a mikvah with a full immersion symbolizing they were to submerge themselves in God's holiness because they're the priests. And then in Leviticus 8, 35 and 36, it says, therefore, so you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days, and keep the charge of the Lord so that you don't die, for so I am commanded. 
So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. So here they are. They are in God's presence, right? Well, guess what? It's now dangerous to be in God's house. I mean, you're in God's house. You, I mean, talk about following protocol. If, uh, if you don't, you die. Now, what's going to happen? So actually, this took place seven days before Nisan 1. Nisan 1 is the eighth day uh, that all these events took place. Now, look at Jeremiah 7, 22 through 26. This is from the Haftorah. And look at this. I did not speak to your fathers, nor command them in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. So there were no Ten Commandments. There were no commandments when he saved them, which tells us our keeping of the commandments do not save us. It's only his grace, only his mercy can save us. After he saves us out of Egypt, he says, okay, you're my kid, so I'm going to tell you what you have to do. He didn't tell the rest of the world what they had to do. The rest of the world was pagan. They did whatever they want. But God's commandments are only for his kids. Think about that. You don't keep the commandments to become his kid. You keep the commandments because you are his kids. That needs to be understood. He says, this is what I did command them. Obey my voice and I'll be your God and you'll be my people and you will walk in all the ways that I have commanded you that it may be well with you. But look what it says. They didn't listen. They didn't incline their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their own evil heart. They went backward, not forward. Since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this very day, I have even sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, daily, rising early and sending them. Yet they hearkened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck, and they did worse than their fathers. Isn't that just crazy? But, and Jeremiah is a thousand years after Moses. A thousand years. Uh, and they were just rebellious. They didn't want to do. But he said, my yoke was easy. My burden is light. Don't ha- love each other. Don't harm each other. See, the problem with love is everyone wants to define love in their own way. That's why the Torah is there to tell us how to love. There are stalkers who stalk people. That is not love, but in their mind, they think it is love. This is why the whole purpose of the Torah is to give definition to what love is. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Avinu Malkenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we can come and worship you. Father, we definitely want to be a light of your Torah to the nations of the world. I thank you that we can all come together and form one big light. And Father, I thank you also for the, the offerings that come in to your ministry. This is yours. It's not ours. God, this is your ministry to bring light to all the nations of the world. So I thank you so much for those locally around the United States, around the world that want to sow into your kingdom. We know the time is short and we don't want to be caught burying the finances you have given to us into the dirt so they don't bring forth fruit. We want all of everything that we have, all the talents that you have given us to earn interest, heavenly interest by putting it to work. You don't want a bunch of money given to you when you come. You want your children. And God, we want to put all of our efforts into making you happy and be us being so thankful because you bless us by bringing your kids to you. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of your Holy Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break and stairs if you can volunteer. And what we're going to be doing now is digging deeper into the Gospels. Uh, even into the New Testament. And 
we're going to begin with Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1 through 3. Here it comes to pass, Yeshua had made an end of what? Sav, commanding. His 12 disciples, he departed there to teach and to preach in the cities of his disciples. And then it says, when John had heard in the prison the works of the Messiah, he sends two of his disciples and said unto the Messiah, are you he that should come or do we look for another? Okay, so here's John. He's in prison and he's waiting to be released because he's about to get his head chopped off. All right. And he's asking, are you the one that should come or do we look for another? Now, many people think, why would he ask that when he's the cousin and he's the one who announced, here's the Lamb of God and all this? Does anyone have an answer why he would have sent his disciples to ask Yeshua when he grew up with them as a cousin? Does anybody have an answer? I know John would. What? Exactly. The Jews have always believed there would be two messiahs. We see one messiah and two comings. They always saw two messiahs and one coming. And I'm going to explain that. Now, why in the world would they think there would be two messiahs? All right. Well, we have to put our hats on from 2,000 years ago. Hindsight is 2020. Okay, but we have to put on our yarmulkes, okay, from 2,000 years ago. And look at this verse, Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. He is very humble and he's riding on a donkey and upon a colt, the foal of a donkey. So here, you can see on the screen, as they saw the Messiah coming very humbly on a donkey. But wait, there's more. Look at Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So look at the screen. They also see the Messiah coming with the clouds, the son of man. And so they go, gee, that's that's powerful. That's mighty. That's a king. So does he come on a donkey or does he come with the clouds? Okay, so how do you, how do we, how do we know? They said, well, there had to be two. There had to be one because of Isaiah 53, a suffering servant that will die for the nation. And then right after that comes the conquering king, okay, who establishes the kingdom. Makes total sense to me. I mean, when you think about it, if you were here 2,000 years ago and you had these two verses, you would think there would be two also. So what John is asking him, are you the suffering servant or are you the conquering king? Are you the one that's coming and do we look for another? Are you going to somehow serve both roles or do we look for another? So that's what John was asking him, okay? And that's real important to understand what their thinking was, but I also wanted to justify why they thought that way. I mean, that would make sense to me as well if I saw these two verses and I'm trying to understand them. Just like today, there's a lot of New Testament verses. We try to figure it out and we don't know because they could be, they look contradictory. Well, <clears throat> here's something I need to mention. How many of you know they didn't have printing presses 2,000 years ago? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Only a very wealthy family would have possessed even a single scroll of one of the books of the Bible. Because they, the, 
Torah took a year for one person to write, a whole year for one person to write one scroll. All right, so if you wanted the book of Jeremiah or if you wanted the book of Obadiah or whatever, you'd have to pay a priest to scribe it and not anyone could do it. You couldn't, have, you couldn't write your own. It, it wasn't any good. You had to have someone who was authorized to write the scroll. And it cost a lot of money. And so the only time they would hear is typically uh, at the end of every year, they come together and they would read only certain portions. They wouldn't read the whole Torah. So a lot of people back then had never even heard it, let alone read it. So what do we find? Instead, what would happen? An entire community would have a Torah scroll or have the different books, all right? And whole communities would pool their money together to produce copies of the scriptures. And then these community scrolls would be kept in the local synagogue. They were neither convenient to access and they weren't necessarily portable either. So the primary education of Jewish children was the word for word memorization of the scripture. They memorize it. That's what they would do. Beginning at age five, at age five, Jewish children uh, would begin to memorize. They had to be five years old. And the memorization of large passages of scripture, even the entire books, resulted in a highly developed mode of communication for religious Jews. The scriptures were set to music as well. That's that. I've been to Shiloh, and I've been to the schools, and the kids are all singing the Hebrew of the books. It's all set to music. They were able to reference a particular passage or prophecy by citing only a few key words. If I were to say to you, for God so loved, you you just go ahead and I only have to quote a few words and you know the rest of it. Or I could just give the reference. How many of you know John 3, 16? All of you know it, right? This is so important for us to realize that they had much of the Bible memorized. Now, I'm going to uh, tell you a, a little joke to get, uh, because it's a point. There was this guy, he's new to prison, and he goes in prison, he's behind the bars, and he, yell, so he hears someone yell out, 42, and everybody cracks up laughing. Oh, that is just hilarious. And he goes, what in the world? Someone else yells out, 18, and everybody in the whole prison just starts cracking up laughing. He goes, what in the world is going on? So he asks his roommate and the roommate says, well, we know all the jokes. So we just assigned him numbers and we say a number and everyone remembers the joke and they all laugh. He goes, well, let me try that. And he goes, eight, nobody laughs. Man, I must've picked a bad joke. Let me try another one. 36, nobody laughs. He looks at his friend. What's going on? He goes, well, some people don't know how to tell a good joke. (laughs) But my point, (laughs) my point is all the people in Messiah's day with only a few words knew what Messiah was talking about. He didn't have to quote the whole thing. They had it memorized. And remember, it wasn't a Gideon Bible back then. Okay, he wasn't quoting any of the New Testament. All right, let's see. So when Yeshua tells John's disciples to report to him, the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor, he's actually citing at least two important passages about the coming of the kingdom of heaven from the book of Isaiah. And John would have known those passages. Just by saying those few words, John could recall what they were. Let me give you one of them. It's Isaiah 35, three through six. Strengthen the weak hands, confirm the feeble knees, say to them that are of a fearful heart. Okay, guess what? That's John. He's of a fearful heart. He's about to get his head chopped off. He's in prison. Be strong, don't fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, 
He will come and save you. Boy, I, if I was John, I'd be saying, woohoo. Okay, then, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame man will leap as a heart. The tongue of the dumb will sing. In the wilderness shall waters break out in streams in the desert. We'll look at Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them who are bound. Where is John? He is bound. All right. And this is a, a, a verse uh, he knew very well. And so he's thinking, yay, I'm out of here. Okay. And then it says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And here's John saying, well, what about me? How many times is our prayer not, God, when are you going to help them? It's always, when is it going to help me? God wants us to be more concerned about the them, not about the us or me. Well, uh, in one sense, uh, metaphorically, Yeshua fulfilled all those things. I mean, he died. Yes, he got his head chopped off. But guess what? The, the doors were open for him. He was set free from this mortal body. So we always have to realize sometimes God answers our prayer, but in a different way than we thought he would. In Genesis 38, 27 through 29, it says it came to pass in the time of her travail. Behold, twins were in her womb, and it came to pass when she travailed that one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, this one came out first, and then it came to pass as he drew back his hand, the other brother came out, and she says, how have you broken forth? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Peretz. And what does Peretz mean? Breach. Okay, so he's named after what, hey, because this breach came forth, we're going to call you Breach. That's what happened. But let's watch as this unfolds. In Ruth 4, 18 through 22, here are the generations of Mr. Breach. Breach begat Hezron, begat Ram, begat Amenadab, begat Nakshon, who begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz Obed, Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Now, most of you are familiar with all of the inside teaching to this, I believe. Uh, it's, it's amazing because the letter Vav is missing in the word generations. It, the first time generations is mentioned, the Vav is there as a letter. The next 70 times in the Bible, it's misspelled intentionally. Okay, now in English, we don't intentionally misspell it because we think it's a mistake, but God purposely did it that way. Because the Vav is a connection. And after Adam's sin, the connection was broken between heaven and earth. But the Vav returns and is spelled correctly here when it talks about the generation of the one who caused the breach. Okay, we know back then Adam caused the breach. Well, here, the guy named Breach is the one who ends up in his ancestry bringing forth King David. And that is why the Vav is back in the word generations. Well, here's the thing. And when you think of John, okay, the Baptist, Yochanan, the immerser, we're, we're going back to the Gospels. I want to bring this out. Here in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, God is saying, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will clear the way before who? Wow. Right there tells you God is the one coming. And he's going to clear, he's going to have a messenger clear the way before he comes. John was the one who cleared the way before God came. And look at Malachi 4, 3 through 6. In these last days, God said, you are going to tread down the wicked. Everyone's worried about the, they're afraid of the devil. I'm not afraid of the devil. It says we're going to tread him down. For they will be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. And the whole key is to remember the Torah. If you want to be stomping on the devil and the wicked, you have to have the Torah, which I commanded to him in Oreb for all of Israel with the statutes and the judgments 
And then it says, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Okay, now let's think about this for a minute. John the Baptist is not Elijah. He came in the spirit of Elijah. And when Yeshua quoted Isaiah 61, he stopped before he said the great and terrible day. All right, he stopped right before then because this was his first coming. That applies to his second coming. And then it says the purpose of Elijah is to turn the heart of the fathers toward their children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, well, that was happening back in his time as John operated in the spirit of Elijah. But what's important for us to realize is that's what's supposed to be happening now. You know, the biggest problem in society today is a lack of fathers. It really is. They're not, they're not there for their kids. We have to, as fathers, we have to be there for the kids. Too often, the fathers get focused on what they're doing, their job, their careers, what's going on. They don't have time for the kids, and the kids all need a father. They come from broken families. But God is going to do something huge where he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers toward the children, in which case the children's heart will be turned back uh, toward the fathers. So important, man, that is just so important today. But concerning John, look what it says in Luke 1, 17, talking about John. He will go before his face in the spirit and power of Elijah, turning the hearts of the fathers to their children and wrongdoers to the way of righteousness to make ready a people whose hearts have been turned to the Lord. So this is referring to Malachi, but it's not Elijah. It's John who's operating in the spirit of Elijah. Now, here's another one. Look at Matthew 11, verse 12. It says, from the days of Yochanan the Immerser, or John the Baptist, until now, look at this. The kingdom of heaven is suffering violence, and the violent are taking it by force. Now, how many of you have ever wondered, what in the world does that mean? As a matter of fact, the word for violence is Hamas. What in the world? It says that the kingdom of heaven is suffering from Hamas, and Hamas is going to take it by force. Does that even make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. There is an ancient rabbinic interpretation that helps us completely understand this verse. This is why you know you have to know how to eat the meat and throw out the bones. Okay? There's a lot of good meat there. Well, listen to this. Look at Micah chapter 2, verse 12. That's the key to interpreting this verse. <clears throat> it says, I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like the sheep of Botsrah, like the flock in the midst of their fold. Okay, so what we have here is the picture of a shepherd pinning up his sheep for the night. All right, he's pinning them all up for the night and it's in cramped quarters, they can hardly move. There's like a hundred people in an elevator. <laughs> There's no room. Well, look at the next verse. They shall be in commotion because of men. And then it's Peretz. The breaker has come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and have gone out of it and their king will pass before them and the Lord at the head of them. So this is the word parats, parats. There's a breaker that is going to come to allow the king to go at the head of them. So what is happening the following morning, the sheep begin to push and shove trying to get out after being pinned up all night in cramped quarters. Literally breaking through, finally bursting out into the open spaces after the shepherd. Now, the rabbis, their interpretation of this verse was that the breach maker would be Elijah, who would prepare the way for the king who was the coming Messiah. So here's how you explain that verse. Matthew eleven twelve. 
Go back to Luke chapter 16, verse 16 and 17. It says, the law and the prophets continued until who came? John. And from that time, and he's the one who's supposed to be preparing the way for the Messiah. It says, from that time, the good news of the kingdom of God has been spreading and all people have been forcing their way into it. But is it, it is easier for earth and sky to pass away than for one smallest detail of the law to fall to the ground. Okay, so let me explain. Two simultaneous things are happening at the same time. The kingdom of heaven is bursting forth into the world when Messiah came. Individuals are now finding their liberty and their freedom. John the Baptist, as a type of Elijah, was the poretz or the breach maker who broke open the way and the King Messiah Yeshua is now following, leading the sheep through the gates. So when it says, instead of reading it as the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence and the violent are taking by force. This is why English is so bad and the lack of understanding. Here's how it should be. Let me see. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven is now breaking out and those breaking out are breaking out into the kingdom of heaven. So it's like, wow, Messiah is here. John prepared the way, Messiah is here. And now all of God's people are breaking out of these cramped quarters into the freedom of the open space. So it's not violence, it's breaking out. It's a total misunderstanding. Yeshua is not sanctioning violence as a means of advancing his kingdom. The simple meaning is ever since John began his ministry, people have been pouring into the kingdom. Yeshua's listeners would have been familiar with the terminology and they probably would have understand that the Poretz was a messianic reference. Okay, does anybody not follow me? So the whole thing about the kingdom suffering violence really means the kingdom is breaking out. This is why, again, uh, Danny and I are working on a new Bible to help people understand. And then look at Matthew chapter 11. And this is verse 28 through 30. Do you remember earlier I talked about finding rest for your souls? I'll read it again here. But look at Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Yeshua says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find what? Rest. Like I always said, there's nothing new in the New Testament. Everything is quoting the Tanakh and then giving meaning to it, if we know how to connect the dots. This comes from Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. It says, thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths because that's where the good way is and walk there and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we don't want to walk that way. And so God is telling us uh, how to find rest is by putting on the yoke of the kingdom. But what happens? Yeshua is using similar language to criticize the Pharisees and the teachers of the Torah in his day who made the practical observance of Torah difficult by adding layers of fences, additional legislation and minutia to the commandments of God. Basically, what they would wanna do, just like if you have something you don't want the kids or the dog or cat to break. You put a, something around it to protect it. They wanted to protect the commandments. Just, this is the problem that Adam had. If you remember, I don't know how many of you knew this, Eve wasn't created when the commandment gave not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He wasn't even created. He didn't exist. That's right. He didn't exist. And so God gave Adam the commandment and then he says, I need to find a helpmeet for you. Okay. 
And so then he brings all the lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And it says none of them was a proper helpmeet. So then God brings to Adam Eve. Okay, so Eve never heard the commandment. And what was the commandment? Not to eat of the tree. But what did Adam do? He added, don't you even touch it. By putting the fence around the commandment, don't eat it, and saying, don't even touch it, which wasn't what God said. He put a fence around the commandment by saying, I'm going to guard this commandment by adding, don't even touch it or you'll die. Eve never, that's all Eve heard. So Eve, when she goes up and touches it and she looks at Adam and she didn't die, she said, you lying to me? You may be lying to me about eating it as well. And so what happens when we put commandments, we, that's why it says in Deuteronomy 4 as well as in Revelation 22, don't add or subtract to God's commandments. But that's been man-made traditions for the last 2,000 years. We've added all these fences, and then we put a fence around the fence to protect the fence, and then we put a fence around the fence that's around the fence to protect it, and then we put another fence around that fence, around that fence, around that fence to protect it. That's what's happened in Judaism, but it's also what happened in Christianity but we've been adding and subtracting from the word of God. And so therefore, that's where a lot of the problem is. Now, uh, let's see. The cumulative result of centuries of man-made tradition uh, has derived laws that were a heavy yoke that made practical observance of the Torah difficult, just like in how to keep the Sabbath. The Bible doesn't tell you exactly how to keep the Sabbath. Okay, it, now, uh, the Orthodox Jews derive like 70 some things you're not supposed to do based on how they interpret the scripture or whatever. But uh, Yeshua offers a simpler approach that prioritizes compassion towards one's fellow and the alleviation of human suffering. That's the way he looks at it. That's why it says, hey, if the person's donkey falls in the ditch and he's got a heavy load, don't worry about the Sabbath, go help the poor donkey or go help the neighbor. But uh, they have it uh, to the point where, and, and they always look at ways to dodge it, like they're not even supposed to turn on lights. So what do they do? They have the neighbor come and turn on their lights. I mean, but there's a lot of things that they do to get around it. Uh, I think one of them is they have to walk on the Sabbath. You know, they can't drive on the Sabbath because that's lighting a fire, in, a spark in your engine. So what do I see most people do? All the Chabad people will drive 40 miles to the synagogue, park two blocks from the synagogue, and then they'll get out and walk the two blocks. You know, uh, I, but anyway, uh, they made, they made keeping the Sabbath such a hardship. It's like, golly. So that's the, I had someone uh, very famous who I won't mention call me and they said, uh, Pastor Mark, I have a swimming pool in my backyard and I'm in an argument with my wife whether I can swim on the Sabbath. She said I shouldn't swim on the Sabbath and I think I should swim on the Sabbath. Okay, is that breaking the Sabbath? You know, and so the first thing I said is, no way I'm jumping in the middle of between you and your wife. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I said, but here is a principle. The, ba the Bible says the Sabbath is to be a day set apart. If you swim every day of the week, don't swim on the Sabbath. If you don't swim during the week, swim on the Sabbath. It's about setting it apart. You following me? So uh, to me, we need to realize the whole purpose of the Sabbath is to find rest with God, build a relationship like mother and daughter, father and son. Uh, it's, it's a type of the millennial reign when we're here with the Messiah. Uh, don't get caught up in the minutia of legalism in keeping the Sabbath. Uh, that's not what it's about. And I, think the, and I think for some people, it may be different than other people. I, I don't think there's one standard that fits all. I mean, for some people, they want to know if their kids can play soccer on the Sabbath. I'm, I'm serious. These are some of the different things. 
You know, for some people, that would be horrible. But for other people, it's not a problem at all. Well, guess what? I am no one's Holy Spirit. You ask the Holy Spirit. That's just it. I I am not here to control anybody. I'm not here to manipulate anybody. I'm just here to tell you, listen to the Holy Spirit, see what he says. But I know the main thing is have fun, be with family, and uh, playing soccer, you're having fun and being with family, and you're thanking God you can still play soccer? Great. I don't have a problem with that. You know, but it's, again, I am not anybody's Holy Spirit. Okay, now, let's look at this. Um, for example, in Matthew 12, 1 and 2, it says, At that time, Yeshua went on the Sabbath day through a field of corn, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, your disciples do that, which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. That's not true. And just so you know, there were seven different groups of Pharisees, and they all had seven different opinions. So this is only speaking of one group of the seven types of Pharisees. A lot of them said that they encouraged them to do that. But if you go back and look at what the Torah says, the Torah literally says, if you're going through a field, you can go ahead and take all you want and eat it, but you can't put any in your pockets. You can't bring a basket in and rip your neighbor off of stealing all of his food. That's called stealing. But if you're walking through, grab a couple of grapes. God doesn't care. All right? So again, you have to go back and look at what the Torah says. And uh, Yeshua, oh, as a matter of fact, this is in the Talmud in Yoma 85b. It says that... uh, The saving of human life always supersedes the Sabbath laws. And that's what the Pharisees thought. Well, let's go to Matthew 12, 3. Yeshua says, haven't you read what even King David did when he was hungry? And those that were with him, he entered into the very temple and he ate the showbread, which wasn't lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. God didn't care. They were trying to survive. They, you know, they were in a battle. Matthew 12, 5 through 8, he says, Or have you not read in the Torah how on Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I'm telling you that in this place is one greater than the temple. And if you had known what that means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. What does that mean? That means he's the Lord of the Sabbath day. All right? He's not going to change it from Saturday to Sunday. He, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the boss. He's the one who instituted it. Now, Yeshua's argument is based upon a rabbinical principle known as call the Comer from the light to the heavy. If it was permissible for David and his men to eat what was ordinarily forbidden and on the Sabbath day because they were hungry, how much more so is it permitted for the son of David and his men? Likewise, if it is permitted for the priests ministering in the temple to bake and eat the bread of the presence of the on the Sabbath day, how much more so is it permissible for those ministering to one who is greater than the temple, the Messiah, to satisfy their hunger on the Sabbath day? But now I want to close with this idea of the finger of God in the commandments. Let's go to Matthew. I'm going to bring up here is Moshe with the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. Listen to Matthew 12. And this is verse 22 through 28. It says, Then was brought to Yeshua one who was possessed with a devil, blind, dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spoke and saw, and all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Now, what were they saying when they were proclaiming him as the son of David? He's the Messiah. Because his dad was supposedly Joseph, and they all knew that. And so when they say, is this not the son of David? They're saying, isn't this the Messiah? And then when the Pharisees heard it, 
they were very upset and they said, why he casts, uh, this fellow does not cast out devils, but by the prince of the devils, Beelzebub, and Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be brought to desolation. Kind of like the United States right now. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan is casting out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, am casting out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. And then he says, if I cast out devils by what? The spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. So here he says, if I'm casting out devils by the spirit of God, and you're saying the spirit of God is a devil, you're in deep trouble. But let's look how Luke translates this situation. And Luke eleven twenty, 20, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. So what do we see here? The spirit of God refers to the finger of God. You following me? But now look at Exodus 31, 18, back at the time of the 10 commandments. And he gave to Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, the two tablets of testimony, tables of stone, written with what? That means the Ten Commandments were written by the Spirit of God. So we can't look at the laws of God and the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God is getting away of the law of God when the Spirit of God is the one who wrote the laws of God. So many people see the Spirit of God and the law as opposite. Christians today see, well, I go by the Spirit. Hmm, well, guess what? The Spirit is the one who wrote the commandments. All right? So you have to have a, a different understanding of what's going on here. And I hope that helps. With that, let's stand. And let's pray. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much. And I pray again as we... Look again at the Brit Hadashah. We, we understand that it all is coming from the Tanakh and you're bringing a greater revelation. So Father, I pray that the, the people that are here, I thank you so much for them. They're like meat eaters. They don't want just the milk and the cookies. And Father, I pray you would just put it within all of their hearts that they too would teach others these principles as they come across those who are contrary to your word. And Father, we just thank you so much that you want to put not only a big blessing upon us, but you want to put your name upon us, even as you told Aaron to say, Ivarekaka Adonai Vaish Mareka, Yaer Adonai Panavileka Vichuneka, Yisa Adonai Panavileka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that most wonderful name, Eyeh, Asher, Eyeh. Amen. And if you want to, uh, come in Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday to get your books. And don't forget to sign up if you can help. Yes.